Let me add my uh, happy new year, happy 2016. I'm looking forward to 2016. I'm looking forward to this series that we're beginning for the next eight weeks on parables, parables in scripture, parables in our lives. This morning, looking at acted parables. So this is a, a bowl of marble. So in some way, you could consider this bowl like a parable of our lives where every marble that's inside it sort of represents an experience or a thought or an idea that we've had and sometimes they fit together in a jumbled way where we don't completely understand how they fit and yet they're held somehow together in our lives and every time we have a new experience or more experiences, more marbles are felt to the complexity of who we are. And, but sometimes when we encounter God in our lives, something happens and... <laughs> it just sends everything everywhere. <laughs> So that was a difficult thing to rehearse. In fact, we didn't <laughs> rehearse it. So I should uh, give a little disclaimer. Um, uh, if you have a marble in front of your feet, please don't slip on it. And uh, for the musicians and for Heather uh, and the, the offering ushers later on, uh, our liability doesn't cover <laughs> your slipping on a marble, so, so please don't. <clears throat> But there we go. And, and after the service, uh, we'll, you know, kids can get marbles and, and collect them. And, but if you want, you can kick them towards the front for uh, the sake of safety and so on. All right, so that was an example of an acted parable. I'm not sure if it was a good idea or not. Uh, the jury is still out. But here's the intention behind it, is that you have an expectation of normalcy, right? I'm supposed to get up, and I'm supposed to start talking, and you're supposed to sort of settle into, okay, what's this about? But then, a surprise, something doesn't fit uh, the expectation, and you have to reevaluate. What does this mean? Where am I? Is Rich losing his marbles both <laughs> figuratively and literally? Uh, and, and maybe you connect the symbolic meaning to uh, the, the action. Usually with a, an acted parable, that happens a little bit later on. Maybe our lives do have this normalcy, and maybe if we do encounter God, it does throw everything out the window. It does add chaos to our ordered, normal lives and upset things. So, again, you might connect these things, but, but again, you might just come back to like, no, that's a crazy uh, thing to do, and I'm certainly not going to clean up those marbles afterwards. I, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so an acted parable is a symbolic action that's intended to draw our attention to a greater truth or a spiritual reality. So in our shared story as people of faith, starting in the scriptures, there are lots of acted parables. And before full-blown acted parables, there are lots of symbolic actions. They're everywhere in scripture. Even the language of Hebrew is made up of, uh, of characters and pictures. So in the ancient Near East, communication by words was valued, but, but communication, actions speak louder than words. Symbolic actions were valued even more. In scripture, the Old Testament is full of altars being built and hands being raised in blessing or bowing before God. When people are in anguish or sorrow, they tear their clothes, they rend uh, their garments as a, as a symbolic action. There's lots of ritual hand washing and feet foot washing. When solemn oaths are made, the hand is put close to the loins, and that's how you make a, a solemn vow. And some symbolic acts are more elaborate than others. So for example, in Abraham's day, if you and I were to enter an agreement with one another, a covenant, and if we were really serious about our covenant and wanted to be bound by that covenant, one of the ways we could do that was to make a uh, blood covenant. And I asked Gord about this, and they typically don't do these in his office if you're entering a contract or agreement. 
But you take an animal, like a goat or a ram, and you split it in half after it's dead, of course, uh, and then w- both people of the agreement would walk between the two halves of that animal. And that's a blood co- covenant that basically says, if I don't keep my vow to you, may this happen to me. And there's this really interesting story in Genesis 15 where God and Abraham enter into a blood covenant. So God makes these beautiful promises to Abraham. He promises he's going to give him descendants beyond the stars of the the sky. And he's going to give him land. And he's going to be his God. And Abraham and his children after him will be his people forever. And Abraham asks, how will I know that these promises are good? So God calls Abraham to grab a heifer, a ram, a goat, a pigeon, and a dove. And every, every animal except the birds is actually split in two. And Abraham spends most of the day trying to wave off and, and scare away all the birds of prey who are trying to get to these carcasses. But then, and waiting for him and God to enter in this covenant. But then, at night, God puts Abraham into a deep sleep. And then, uh, symbolically, as, as fire and as, as smoke, Abraham doesn't pass through the two halves of all the animals, but God himself goes through the two animals, symbolizing, saying to Abraham, you don't even need to keep your side of the covenant. I will keep my faithful vows to you. I will be faithful God to you. So do actions speak louder than words? I'm not sure, but symbolically acting out our words is evidently not just important or meaningful to human beings, but it's meaningful to God as well. And then as scripture develops, symbolic actions developed maybe to their height, to the acted parables that especially happen among the prophets of Israel and Judah. So the prophets speak truth to power, but they speak to all people God's message using powerful symbols. For example, God told Ezekiel to shave his head and his beard, and then to take his hair and to scatter a third of it into the wind. And then to take a third of his hair and chop it up with a sword. And then take another third of his hair and to burn it, to singe it with fire. And then to take a little bit of that hair and hide it in his garment. And the meaning of that was because that would be what would happen to the people facing exile. Some would be scattered to the winds. Some would be destroyed with fire. Others would be put to the sword. But just a small remnant would be spared and God would restore again. Kind of dark, right? Uh, Some of the symbolism and acted parables of the prophets were sort of dark. And Ezekiel had his fair share. He was also instructed at one point to eat a scroll. At another time, God told him to cook his food with human dung. So Ezekiel responded, argued with God. That's disgusting. (laughs) But but more his argument was, I've been kosher all my life. I, I couldn't possibly do that. So God relents, okay, well, you can cook your food with cow dung instead. It's a concession, I guess. So Again, this meaning was to symbolize the the impurity, the uncleanness of God's people of Israel. And you get the same thing that happens with other prophets, like Hosea, who's commanded to marry a prostitute. And it, it sounds strange, it sounds dark, but again, it becomes this deeply meaningful story how Hosea's being faithful to his unfaithful spouse is a picture of God who loves us and who promises to be faithful to us, his people, even when we reject him and turn the other way. The prophet Jeremiah uh, performed a lot of acted parables, and a lot of them are dark also, but there's one really hopeful one, and in one acted parable, he buys a piece of land just outside of Jerusalem while war is raging all over the landscape, and by his own prophecy, Jerusalem is about to fall, and they're about to lose all this land to their enemies, and the people think that Jeremiah is crazy, but he buys this land as a prophetic sign that though Jerusalem would fall, God would restore the people and bring them back to their land again. So there's lots more examples, but when you read the prophets, and this may be just me, but the way the picture that emerges for me of the prophets in scripture are basically these eccentric characters who did these really weird things, really weird public stunts that had intention and meaning, 
but were also quite strange. And you have to wonder how people reacted. Like when they see these people coming, they might get a little bit nervous. Oh, great, here comes Jeremiah. What's he going to be up to next? Just yesterday, I saw him walking through town with a, an ox yoke on his head and, and in his arms. So ew, what's, what's going to happen? And what's that guy doing walking around barefoot in no, in, in no shirt? Oh, yeah, that's, that's Isaiah. He's been doing that for the better part of uh, three years. I guess he's saying something like it's a symbol of Egypt's depravity. I don't know. God, God told him something. They're weird characters who did weird things. But you'd think that, was, that weirdness was confined to the Old Testament, but it's actually not. So there's another person who kind of did some weird things that continually surprised and confused all those around him, And that was Jesus. Jesus very much stood in this prophetic tradition with acted parables. So we often think of Jesus as the one who spoke in parables, but he acted in parables just as much. Symbolic acts that spoke even louder than words. So one of the most famous ones, of course, is uh, John 13, when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And Immediately, instinctively, we recognize the power of that symbol where the exalted one, the Most High, humbles himself, empties himself out of love and serves at the feet of the ones he loves. And it's beautiful, but to be honest, I've tried to imagine the scene. It must have been really awkward and weird, and I kind of identify with Peter in that story. It would have been sort of strange to be there like, Jesus, why are you doing that? Put, put your clothes back on. Why are you washing my feet? It's, it's strange. But Jesus insisted on doing it because he knew the power of the acted parable, these symbolic actions. And that was a really intimate parable, but Jesus had lots of other parables that were much more public, like on Palm Sunday when he rode in on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem in the last week of his life. He was acting out this scripture that talked about the Davidic king coming back to his people and God's humble servant. And then once inside the city, Jesus goes into the temple and starts turning over tables and driving out the money changers. And growing up, I always understood that this was, you know, this spontaneous act of Jesus losing his temper and acting out of passion. But he may well have been angry, and he was most certainly passionate, but it was anything but spontaneous. It was, it was a deliberate act of declaring God's judgment against the temple, saying that this is the way that God has, through this temple, is how God has related to his people. Now it's going to be through me, the new temple. But even with things like the other things Jesus did, feeding the 5,000 or calming the the wind and and the sea, walking on the water, healing the blind man, can you picture that, that story where Jesus spits in the dirt and he makes mud on the ground, and he puts it on a person's eyes and and heals them, cursing a fig tree so that it withers, casting out demons out of a guy, uh, and the demons are called legion, and they go into pigs that fall in the water and drown. They're not just cool stuff that Jesus did. Well, they are cool stuff that, that Jesus did, but they're also loaded with symbolic meaning. And like spoken parables acted parables, they're not just illustrations. So they can be illustrations, but they're actions that draw our attention to something else as well. So the fact that Ezekiel, you know, cooked his food over dung is not an invitation, well, go and do likewise. That's what we all should do. Not at all, but it's supposed to jar people to grab their attention and point them towards what is God doing? What is God saying in all of this? Also, something being symbolic doesn't mean it's not real. So there's this Catholic theologian uh, I was listening uh, to in a podcast this week uh, who wrote a book called Christ, the Symbol of God. And he got lots of flack and and complaints about that. Uh, So he changed it to say Christ, the Sacrament of God. And he said, I mean the exact same thing by it. By saying Christ is the symbol of God, I'm not saying Christ isn't also God, but Christ is also the symbol, the one that draws our attention to God. So just because something's symbolic doesn't mean it's not also real. 
So when Jesus washes his disciples' feet, there's both two things going on. First, there's this universal reality that he's shining a window to God's love, God's willingness to empty himself in his deep love for people. But at the same time, it was also a particular room at a particular time with particular people that Jesus was showing his love to. And to me, that's kind of the definition of a sacrament. It's an act that simultaneously is very present, but it also points to a larger reality. So less philosophically, as an example, if you buy uh, a sandwich for somebody who's hungry, there's two things going on. On the one hand, you're wanting to help that particular person on a Tuesday afternoon at 4.30 on 8th Avenue uh, because they have a particular hunger. But at the same time, you're wanting to image and to participate in the life of God who sees our needs, who feeds our deepest hunger. And while our act doesn't change the world, our act is also putting our faith in the one who can and does change the world. At least ideally, that's what, what sacramental living looks like. So where do acted parables show up today? And that's a great question. And there's plenty of symbols and symbolic acts in our world, in our culture. Reflecting on this a little bit this week, though, I thought most of those symbolic acts uh, don't wake us up. Instead, they, they put us to sleep, like political speeches. But acted parables are intended to do the opposite. They're intended to jar us and to wake us up. So one example might be protests. Protests often function like acted parables. It's not that the march or the, the sit-in or the, the hunger strike itself is the change, but it's, it's meant to raise awareness, to draw attention to something else. Or when people creatively do something, some sort of public stunt in order to, to draw attention to a cause. That can be an acted parable. Sadly, in, in our world and culture, often that's corporations who put on these, these big public stunts. One of, uh, you, you may well know that I'm kind of a fan of, of Stephen Colbert, uh, but one of his acted parables, public stunts that he did uh, some years ago, was to create on his television show a super PAC and basically raise money for political campaigning. And by creating this real-world organization, by raising over a million dollars toward it, he basically showed and demonstrated the truth of how, you know, it's with enough money, it's pretty easy to influence uh, the elections in the democratic system in, in uh, the U.S. That's an acted parable. Or maybe think of uh, a flash mob. A flash mob can create a space where we imagine something different, where we imagine a world. Imagine a world where all the people at the mall, they're not just automatons who are going about their inner world business to make exchanges of money for goods. No, suddenly they're human beings. They're our brothers and they're our sisters. And here we are dancing together and singing the hallelujah chorus together. And it's beautiful. And that's the power of the acted parable, to jar us into a different way of looking in, at reality. So here's the problem. I, I was uh, preaching some of this stuff. I, I practice oftentimes by following Sherry around with my laptop and, and preaching at her. And it's always a scary moment when later in the week I say, she says something like, that's really interesting. What's the point? <laughs> uh, and I think I knew when I was first drawn to this topic, because I am drawn to it, I, I, I'd have this problem. Because I'm, to be, I might as well confess, I don't really know what to do with the so what uh, question. I love thinking about symbols and scripture and how scripture uses symbols to open up worlds of meaning, how acted parables have the power to illuminate truth. But I'm not sure what that means for us. I have more questions than answers. There is my confession. But then again, maybe that is the point. Maybe the point is to open us up to wonder and to consider. 
I feel like my life, in some ways, I don't know about you, but my life, I feel like it lacks some of the symbolic depth that I see when I look at the story of Scripture. I would like to see my imagination and, and our imagination as a church to grow into that. I'd like to be more aware of the symbols that are already present in my life, because we all do have symbols, rituals in our lives. Like in our house, when we insist at the dinner table, everybody needs to be there. It's a little acted parable that says our value of family and togetherness, even if we're grumpy and arguing and fighting the whole time at the dinner table, there's value in that. Or giving thanks before a meal. I think that's a mini acted parable or maybe shoveling the walk of a neighbor, or maybe creating a, a little public library uh, in front of you or, or on your lawn. Symbolic actions that are on their way to becoming acted parable, parables. And we have some of those at church that we participate in regularly. Some of them are one-offs, like maybe a Christmas Eve service, or maybe a stampede breakfast where we serve our neighbor's uh, breakfast. And coming here on Sundays, in some ways, I think that coming to church on Sunday is a protest. It's a reordering of reality in favor of God and community. And when we do things together, maybe pass an offering plate, or when we stand and sing together, there's a sense in which that's an acted parable. It's a symbolic action. And do we think about what those actions mean? And then, of course, as a church, there's two acted parables that Jesus gave us and, and gave us to continue to do and do and do again and again. Those two acted parables are one, that of baptism, which rehearses, acts out the death and resurrection of Jesus. And also the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, where we take the bread and we take the wine and we act out Jesus' death and resurrection, the center of our story, again and again. And we give words to that every time we do it, but more powerful than the words themselves are the action, the participation, that we're participating in something that Jesus himself called us to do and to do regularly. And isn't that what we talk about when we talk about life and, and how we are imaging God in everything we do and say here, but at work, in our social circles, in everything that we do. We're participants in what God is doing, what God is wanting to get done in our world. Shoveling someone's walk, uh, partaking in communion, but also cleaning a toilet or filling out a spreadsheet at work can be symbolic participation in what God is calling us to do. And I believe that we should see all our lives sacramentally in that way. But I also wonder, what would it look like for us as a church, even, to imagine some acted parables, some one-offs that point towards God, that, that surprise, that jar us to reorder our lives and think, oh, and apprehend, there's God. So here's my prayer and hope for you and me, and I will close with this. Three short things. First, that we would notice the symbols that we have already, like praying before a meal in our house, like at work, when maybe you, you pour that first cup of coffee as you, you greet your coworkers, or like in church when we stand together to sing, not to make idols out of those symbols, but to remember that these have the potential of being symbols that have some power in our lives, markers and, and signposts that point to something greater. So that, and, and sometimes we have to invent meaning, sometimes we have to, to make meaning and, and, and insert it and be intentional about it. So like prayers before our meals, is, it's, it's a reminder, a constant reminder, a, a symbol that, that says everything we have is gift. Everything comes from you. And maybe that pouring a coffee and greeting our coworkers can be a reminder, a symbol that, that speaks to us, wow, I have the privilege of working in the presence of people who are image bearers of God it may not always feel like that at work, but it can feel like that. Or when we stand and sing together that we, we recognize here we are standing in solidarity with our brothers and sisters and, and declaring that the most true thing is God's love that's revealed to us in Christ. So that's first. The other two are shorter. Second, 
My prayer for us is that we'd imagine some new symbols, that we'd uncover new potential acted parables, ways of acting in the world creatively as individuals and as a church that grab attention and point our hearts and heads to God. And then lastly, my prayer for you and for me is that without any catastrophe, without any crisis, without being surprised or jarred or annoyed by a crazy person spreading marvels all over the congregation, that we would be present and aware and alive and awake to know the present God who loves us, who calls us his own, and who draws us toward himself. All right, let's pray together. God, we thank you for the imaginative ways in which you reveal yourself in Scripture. We thank you for the imaginative ways you reveal yourself to us in Jesus. We thank you for the arts, for music, for uh, paintings, for all these things that that draw us in in ways that, that words can't draw us. We thank you for Lord's Supper. We thank you for baptism, these, these rituals, these things that we rehearse that, that call our hearts to reflect and go over and over who you are and who you reveal yourself to be in Christ, his death and resurrection. We pray that we would be imaginative people. people. We pray, above all, that we would be people who notice you in our lives, in our every day, in every moment, that we would live sacramentally, both paying attention to the particulars where you're present, but also proclaiming your universal goodness to all people and spreading that message of your love. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.